So today we're going to look at the enormous potential of Nova Scotia, offshore Canada. Now the video is sponsored by Searcher. They're paying us for this video, but uh, they've given us full editorial rights. So it's an independent review of the region, and uh, we take a look at all the available data, some of which is, uh, is Searcher's data. So to locate where we are, here's a map of the world, and you can see there is uh, Nova Scotia, and the region we're going to look at is the Scotian Shelf, and the, uh, the, the offshore slope. So in more detail, here's a map, and the CNSOPB, <laughs> rolls off the tongue, is uh, the Canada Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board. This is the uh, acreage that they have on offer. There is a bid round that is going to close on the 19th of September 2023. So um, we've got lots of time to, to have a look in this region. Now there are five parcels of acreage on the slope, and there are three parcels in the Sable Island area. So there they are shown on the map here. Now, if we just start off to introduce the area, let's have a look at the stratigraphy and uh, the depositional model. So here's a, an overview of the stratigraphy and you can see it's a predominantly Mesozoic basin with oil discoveries in the uh, late Jurassic to late Cretaceous. So here they are indicated in these symbols here. Predominantly gas has been found in this region Source rocks are thought to be Cretaceous through Jurassic, and indeed there's lots of analyses to confirm that. There are turbidite deep water reservoirs, again of late Jurassic to early Cretaceous age, and we've also got the reefal play. This is the Abenaki formation. This is a reefal carbonate, which we'll have a look at and has been developed in one field at least. And then one of the key things here is this Argo salt. It's Triassic in age. And uh, you'll see that uh, when we get into the deeper water, it becomes very important because uh, we have diaporism and it sets up a lot of traps in the deep water area. So um, here is the setting, a sort of depositional model. North is off to the left here. You can see here Nova Scotia. Here's the shelf itself. And you can see this prograding wedge of sediment here. Here's this uh, Abenaki formation, this uh, this reefal carbonate bank, really. And then as you go out into the deep water here, the Argo salt is getting remobilized and forming all of these diapyric structures. The timing of the progradation, the, the rifting here, you see the breakup on conformity, sort of Triassic to early Jurassic, and then subsequently there's been outbuilding, and essentially it's a passive margin, and we did a video on what a passive margin is recently. So we've got abundant trapping configurations, and we'll have a look at those. So in terms of the development history, well, we just want to have a look at a couple of areas, the first being the Sable Offshore Energy Project, SOEP. So this was um, five fields that were developed. They were all structural traps. The board here is indicated, so you can see this is the sort of trap here, and it's actually the Mississauga fluvio-deltaic sequence that is the reservoir for these gas fields, and they're all very similar. Water depths up to 100 meters. There was uh, first gas in 1999, which indeed was Canada's first offshore gas development. And the fields ceased production back in 2018. Now, 2.1 trillion cubic feet of gas was produced from this region. Here's a look at the infrastructure, and you can see a number of platforms here tied back to the, the central facilities, piped 225 kilometers back to the beach and here we have the gas plant also then up the road here we've got the liquid processing facility so all of this infrastructure has now ceased production but this is what the production profile looked like for the area and it's broken out here by field and you can see all of these fields did fairly well i want to move on now and compare all of these fields with the deep panook you can see here's the uh, SOEP fields, this is the ExxonMobil operated, and this was Pan-Canadian operated, the Deep Panook. And it's an interesting story and really not a, a great success. There was already the Cohasset and Panook fields, which had started production back in 1992. That was uh, Canada's first offshore oil development. Now the reservoirs shown here in both the uh, Logan Canyon and the upper Mississauga but then one of the development wells was actually deepened to go down into the Jurassic, into this uh, Abenaki reefal carbonate here. And it discovered uh, gas, which was uh, sour gas with about 0.18% uh, hydrogen sulfide. 
and uh, do have a look at our video on hydrogen sulfide. It is an interesting story. So that was discovered in 1998, Pan-Canadian. Pan-Canadian became uh, Encarna. Water depths, uh, quite shallow, around about 40 meters. We can also have a look at the seismic for this, and it was a fractured porous reefal sandstone within the Abenaki Formation at around about 3,400 meters subsea. So if you take a look at the infrastructure, we can see that the subsea layout and the top sides for the uh, deep Panuk development, there were four producing wells, and there was one well that was used as a disposal well, which was for the carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, so that was re-injected. So here's a map. What you can see is there were eight wells drilled. One of these wells was non-commercial, and uh, on this uh, southeast side, you can see that it basically come to the end of the uh, the reef. So number of wells, and they all had uh, fantastic flow rates here. And this is the location of the platform. So four of these wells ended up being recompleted as the producers. This is the sort of structure map. Here's the four producing wells. The had a bit of a checkered history. The development plan was initially submitted in 2002 with just shy of a TCF of gas, but then was withdrawn in 2003 and then resubmitted in 2006. And by then the reserves had taken a bit of a haircut and it was around about 650 BCF with a significant range, but an expectation that field life would be in the order of 13 years. Well, Production eventually began in 2013, and it was uh, operated seasonally. And we'll have a look at that in the production profile in a second. But production ceased in 2018, so um, it only managed uh, five years of uh, field life. So the production profile, it's worth spending a little time looking at this. On the y-axis, we have the gas production rate, and the purple dash line, that was the expected profile. The four wells came on, and you can see that they almost got to the expected plateau rate. But then some seasonal outage there. And then when it came back on the next season, the M79A well had disappeared. And here you can see this dark blue line is the water cut or the water rate. And you can see the water rate here on this axis is shot up to over 30,000 barrels per day for just over um, 170 million standard cubic feet. So one of the wells has, has watered out uh, already. And then we have another seasonal shutdown. By the time it comes back on, there's some severe problems because only one of the wells is coming back on. Eventually, they get the second well coming back for a part time. But again, the uh, the water rate is absolutely shooting up here to, to something like 28,000 uh, barrels of water per day. Massive decline. And essentially, all the wells are pretty much on the last legs here. And uh, that was the end of the field. Now, what went wrong? The project cost 560 million US dollars and started off with a good startup rates. However, the early water breakthrough, and that's because it's a fractured carbonate. There were early signs, there were indications of this, because um, in the F-70 appraisal well, there was an indication that 93% of the flow in that well, which was 50 million standard cubic feet of gas, was coming from a single 10 meter highly fractured interval. So so there were these concentrations, uh, these swarms of fractures, open fractures, and, and these were actually allowing for a, a fantastic flow rate. But, of course, they were also probably the conduit for bringing water up, underlying water from the aquifer, which would um, prematurely kill the wells. Now, the Deep Panook is the only fractured carbonate development in the basin, so there wasn't any prior knowledge of this, and it was recognised there was a risk, but it, it actually didn't do as well as was anticipated. So um, it's now been abandoned, and the uh, the platform has been removed. This uh, is just our entry from Trove. You can see we have chapter and verse to understand the geology, the production history, a great sort of analogue for any fractured carbonate uh, reservoir being considered anywhere else in the world. Now I want to turn our attention to the potential. So perhaps the Jurassic fractured carbonate play might not be top of the priority list, but um, but there have been a number of wells up and down, over 200 wells, and lots of information available from the regulator. In terms of seismic, the, the coverage is good, both a lot of regional 2D lines and also quite a large area of 3D. 
some of this uh, data does uh, require reprocessing. It is quite old, and we'll have a look at some of that shortly. So um, what we want to do now is just to have a look at the coverage that Searcher are responsible for brokering and for supplying to interested parties. And you can see a lot of information um, on the 2D, a lot of coverage up on the shelf, some 3Ds in the Sable Island area here as well. And then we'll have a look at this uh, Tangier 3D and have a look at this region. And it's a region in the, uh, the, the ultra deep water area. Um, it goes all the way up to the sort of base of slope. And it includes the Aspie well, which is a very key well in this region. So Aspie D11 was one of only four wells drilled in over 2,000 meters, so in ultra deep water. It was a 2012 uh, BP license, uh, which expired in January of 2022. And uh, the well was drilled in 2019 in quite a water depth and to quite a deep well. It was targeting Cretaceous sands in a subsalt trap. This is the, the rig that drilled it here. And uh, here's the location of Aspie. There are other wells here, uh, Monterey Jack, Cheshire and, and Crimson. Uh, but this is the region of the Tangier 3D. So here's a look at the seismic. You see this uh, salt diaper and, and essentially this salt wing here hanging out. It's interpreted that there is a sort of a salt weld all the way down here. But this is essentially the trap that BP were targeting. And they were targeting this kind of major tilted fault block that occurs down through here. But uh, I always recognized was the potential that there was a leak point here, you know, with this salt touchdown. How effective a seal was that going to be? Lots of analogs in the Gulf of Mexico, of course. Now, if we look in a little bit more detail here, uh, we can see some of the key horizons. This is the well that drilled in this location. These were the major targets here, the K129 and the K130. It does look like these are sort of hard over softs. And you can see that there was some shows here in the K119 sand. But when we have a look at this anomaly here, it actually looks like a very decent soft over hard break. So potentially this was missed. And we'll have a look at a map in just a second of this interval. Here we are. And you can see the Aspie well. This is the TD location here. And you see it didn't actually test this particular anomaly, choosing to go for these anomalies here. But uh, the other thing is, Searcher have done uh, an interpretation where they've looked at this thin sand down here. And if we go and trace that around, we can see that uh, this is how they've interpreted it. So this is RMS amplitude. Let's tie the well here. It really is right on the margin, a very, very thin sand in the, in the particular well. You can see that it's actually interpreted to occur further down slope. And then eventually we've got this fantastic looking channel out here. I mean, at, at some depth for sure, but uh, very significant channelized event. And it looks like we've had sort of this uh, escarpment uh, collapse here and sort of a bypass and all of this uh, sand here avalanching down. And, you know, you can actually make a case that this accumulation here may be uh, associated back with this particular slip. And, and likewise, in this region here, uh, we can see this thick accumulation. Now, it doesn't quite work, but if we uh, look at an, an overlay, and this is amplitude versus offset anomaly, you can see that there are certain parts of it here, in particular, and in here, which do look like they are the structural traps whereas this looks to be a bit of a low and sure enough um, it's uh, there doesn't seem to be a, an AVO anomaly here so this could be more channelized on this particular feature down here or just a thin slither as it, it looks like it's on the leeward side of this particular high here so it looks like there's a, a channelized system that perhaps partly fed from from the slope here and partly fed from down this gradient so some fantastic data and uh, Get in touch with Searcher if you, uh, if you want to see further examples of this. So there is potential in the deep water area. And really, uh, I think one of the lessons, which we've seen in other basins, we've seen in a lot of basins, is that you know one well does not rule off an entire region. And in fact, even locally here, you can see the thin sand better developed elsewhere. And this anomaly here could have been an interesting sidetrack test. So let's have a look at the shelf data. Well, the data hasn't been uh, reprocessed uh, since acquisition. So the vintages are you know, 20 years old or 25 years old. There's over 5,000 square kilometers of merged and filtered full stack data. 
And, you know, it's very difficult to use this this particular data set as is for, for interpretation. This here is an inline across the uh, Marmara, the 1972 shell discovery. And you can see uh, on this quality of data, it's not easy, uh, not easy to interpret anything else. But the sorts of things that searcher would have in mind would be to, to look at the survey inconsistency, look at the uh, complex ray paths in this region, uh, try and get rid of the ghosting, try and boost the signal to noise ratio, and boost the, uh, the lower frequencies. Try and try and do something about this footwall shadows here and uh, image these complex faults. So lots of potential and lots of targets to go for in a, a reprocessing effort. And, and just some examples that, that Searcher have operated. Here's um, one here in India. This is a 2D line. And this is the uh, pre-reprocessing and post-reprocessing. You can see a great improvement. And likewise here in Oman, this is the uh, pre-reprocessing data. And this one... Uh, these particular studies were undertaken uh, along with uh, Shearwater and, and Doug. You can see that uh, gr great improvements can be had in, in reprocessing. So uh, a lot can be done in uh, with the data in this area. If we want to take a quick look at the significant discoveries, a couple of examples. So um, there is a definition in Nova Scotia and a significant discovery, a license on this discovery is infinite or indefinite, which means that the, the license does not have an end date. This is one held by ExxonMobil, drilled back in 1974 in 95 metres of, of water depth. It's thought that it has somewhere in the region about 170 billion cubic feet uh, of P-mean reserves, plus about 10 million barrels of condensate. And it's a, a salt cord rollover anticline, so you can see the rollover in here. Uh, here's a map of the feature. And uh, this is where it's located. It's just, uh, it's not shown here, but it's just to the north of the uh, Uniac discovery. Another example would be the Onondaga, which has got uh, 290 BCF of reserves with 2 million uh, barrels of condensate. So this is quite a lean gas. Again, another salt cord anticline, but this time uh, it is faulted to a degree. You can see here's the well down here. And the actual, the reservoir zone is, is in the, uh, the Mississauga. This was drilled by Shell back in 1969, so there have been uh, major improvements in reservoir, in sorry, in seismic uh, quality since then. And you can see here, here is a map of it. Uh, again, you can see the, the anticline that with some faults in it, and uh, this is the location from map stand. Now, other wells, within the parcels on offer, uh, you can see that there's two wells here, Annapolis and uh, Crimson, shown here, Annapolis and Crimson. And um, they both had some uh, some shows within the Cretaceous. Again, ultra deep water, but they have actually proven that there is a working petroleum system and some pretty uh, good shows in here. So uh, these are the entries we have for these two particular assets uh, within our Trove database. So if we have a look at the petroleum system, well, we've got uh, proven source rocks. Why do I say that? Well, we've got fields and discoveries. We've also got a lot of uh, surface seeps and, and slicks, and, and these have been uh, studied by a number of companies in the area here. We've also got, you know, from searchers' interpretation, sand fairways here, channelized fans coming down. There are traps um, often associated with, with salt, um, but the salt indeed uh, does get quite complicated in parts, and so we've got some potential, some very interesting and some very large-looking uh, what rotated fault blocks. I, I would describe those as looking somewhat encased in salt in, in places. Uh, so great seal potential there, and also with great AVOs. So um, other considerations in this area? Well, it is a region that's looking to develop gas for LNG and the Canadian government is looking for a, a way to uh, supply Europe's energy needs. So, you know, Nova Scotia is only sort of eight days transport time from Europe, whereas the Gulf of Mexico almost double that. The potential um, on what they're looking at here is for a LNG liquefaction plant and terminal. Now there is a regasification plant um, but uh, looking to uh, to see if we can get the LNG terminal up and running at uh, St. John in New Brunswick by uh, sort of 2025 and uh, at Goldborough, the LNG by uh, 2027. Now uh, Goldborough is, is on Nova Scotia. 
other interesting area uh, or interesting initiative is looking at the uh, carbon capture. Now, we already Canada boasts the Alberta uh, Carbon Trunk Line, the ACTL, uh, which is the world's largest CO2 capacity pipeline. Now, um, there are a lot of fields, the Sable Island area fields, that uh, have been abandoned, and there is potential there or capacity for um, over 100 years of storage of of Canada's uh, carbon dioxide. But, you know, it is a long way away here in Nova Scotia from some of the population centres within Canada, although a lot closer to the uh, population centres of northeast USA. There are a number of grants being made available from the government, so 100 million uh, Canadian dollars, grants uh, for investment through the Strategic Innovation Fund, and lots of recent uh, policy changes that enable the import of carbon dioxide. Now, currently there is some carbon dioxide is is actually here uh, being imported from uh, North Dakota into Saskatchewan, uh, and this is being used for an enhanced oil recovery project at the Weyburn Field. Now, many of the pipelines that are shown on here, and and they're all listed in detail, uh, you know, we don't know at this time how many of these are are actually fit for acid gas service, but there is uh, quite a network in existence. So what can we say about uh, Scotian Shelf and Nova Scotia? Well, there is a confirmed petroleum system. It's already produced 2.1 TCF. If you add up all of the undeveloped discoveries, there's over 1.3 TCF of gas there. There is an underexplored slope with, with only four ultra-deep wells, as we showed. There looks to be some um, significant uh, direct hydrocarbon indicators and AVOs. Multiple anomalies uh, remain undrilled. Uh, the traps and uh, the indications of, of reservoir uh, can be clearly seen on, on the seismic. And it's a great exploration opportunity to tr- chase the, the traps and the reservoir. But it does, of course, require good quality seismic data. For CCUS, well, it's early days and LNG, there is potential uh, to actually develop that locally. If you want any further information, please get in touch with Karina, Neil or Debbie at Searcher. Then there's the contact details below. Um, Thank you for watching this video. Please like, subscribe, ring that bell. Look forward to seeing you back on our channel. Bye for now.